for each one. It is so beautiful this morning that we could enjoy ourselves in worshiping where we are. And I believe the presence of the Lord will go with us as we begin with uh, singing some song, praising His name. Uh, let every person who has breath in his life praise His holy name. We want to welcome each one of you to the Sabbath school. And to bring it with us all, join and sing hymn number 369 from SDA Hymnal. From SDA Hymnal, we want to sing the song 369, which is entitled as uh, Bringing in the Sheaves. Nothing was made 
that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. What a profound text that we have. We have read this text many times. I don't know, it has impacted my mind and gave me an insight towards it. And the first chapter of Genesis, when we be able to look into, it is very much the foundation of our scripture. Genesis is the foundation of our scripture. And the major teachings and the doctrines of the Bible had their source in this chapter. The book of Genesis, which means the book of the beginning. The first book of the Pentateuch, which was written by Moses. And here in this book, we do find the nature of Godhead working in harmony. As the Father, as the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three unitedly working towards creation in the beginning. That's what we find in John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. We read, in the beginning was the word. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created. You see, a quite similarity between the gospel of John, what he is talking about in 1, was 1 and 3. And Genesis chapter 1, was 1, in the beginning was the word, and in the beginning God created. So you see, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working in harmony in creation. So all this triune God is working together to create the word and all that is in it. The beauty of the book of Genesis, which means that's the foundational book which emulates an important issue of who God is all about. He was in the beginning. When was the beginning? Nobody knows. And you find the nature of God in the book of Genesis. And you will be able to find okay, that this triune God create the world and all that is in it culminating in humanity. That's what we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. And Genesis also introduces us the Sabbath. The origin of evil is been given in the book of Genesis. The Messiah and the plan of salvation is been inculcated in the book of Genesis. So we have a number of topics being given in the book of Genesis which is absolutely very essential. So the whole combination of good, evil, the plan of salvation, the nature of God and who God is all about and the plan of salvation for humanity, everything is culminated in the book of Genesis which is the foundation of our lives. And if you have to go a little bit further, Father, the worldwide flood which happened during the time of Noah is recorded in the book of Genesis. The covenant being given in the book of Genesis. And the dispersing of the language of people is given in the book of Genesis. The genealogies that provide the framework for biblical theology is given in the book of Genesis. From creation to Adam, you will be able to find uh, an important aspect of what you and I can be able to learn in the book of Genesis. And finally, the power of God, spoken word, that is the nature of humanity, God's character, marriage between a man and a woman, and stewardship of the earth and its resources, and the promised hope of new creation all are based on the first chapter which will be our study this week. So when 
take this book of Genesis, you have almost everything from the time the light began on this earth till the plan of redemption. God has been able to help us to understand in this single book called Genesis. The very meaning of Genesis is the beginning. Okay, let's get into a little bit of uh, uh, Sunday's portion of it. And uh, it is entitled as In the Beginning. And uh, if I have to summarize the whole thing, what has been given uh, in Sunday's chapter, there is deeper truth revealed in it. A very deep truth revealed in it. Okay, if you have to look into the Bible, it opens with the most uh, sublime and the profound words, words that are simple but that simultaneously contain a measureless depth when carefully studied. In fact, if you have to go a little bit further, it says the greatest question of philosophy regarding who we are, why we are here, and how we got here are answered by the first sentence in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We exist here today because God created us as a definite time in the past. We did not evolve ourselves from nothing as Darwinism portrays it as. No, we did not evolve out of nothing. Nor did we come into existence by chance. No way. For no ultimate purpose. I mean, no planned direction, as much of the contemporary scientific model of origin now teaches. No. Darwinian evolution is contradictory to scripture in every way and attempts by some to harmonize it with the Bible makes Christians look very silly. <laughs> you see, in the beginning God created, you see, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, no matter the Bible says, let us make man in our own image. That exemplifies the character of God, united me, joining together in order to be, have been created. That is the beauty of the book of Genesis. We also were created by God at an absolute point in time, that is in the beginning. What does it mean? It means that God existed prior to this beginning. We don't know when was God, how, 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 how God was created, how we existed, but we know that in the beginning that is the, 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 the primary thing that God existed before creation. And that is God existed before time was created and expressed in a daily cycle of evening and morning, you see? Before time existed, he existed. Time was created by God, I guess. And you and I know that very much. God in his own infinite mercy when he created, you can't fathom the mind of God. We can't get into who God is all about. What we know about God is absolutely fragmented. But one thing is sure in the book of Jesus that you and I are created. That's what the psalmist says, that you and I have been wonderfully and fearfully made. Look into the nature, look into the creation, nothing came in chance. Everything was absolutely mind boggling Anything that you can take. Take the sun, moon, and stars. You take uh, every tree and every plant. You take the very human body. It's not by chance. There was a maker who designed everything which was created on this earth. This absolute beginning is echoed and supported by other passages in the scriptures which continue to reaffirms the nature and means of God's creative work. That's what we read in John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. And all things were made to him. That's what it means to say. So the Bible teaches that Jesus is the agent of our creation. The Bible says that all things were made through him and without him nothing was made in John chapter 1 verse 3. Through Jesus he made the words in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. The Bible says Jesus is the one who created. Because all things have their origin in Jesus in the beginning we have, we can have hope that is an end. He will complete what he has begun because he is called as the Alpha and Omega in the book of Revelation. He is the beginning and the end. Many, many times I try to comprehend what does the beginning mean. What does the beginning mean? We know what an end means. But we don't know what the beginning means. Most probably when you and I were being created in the mother's womb. We don't know how it began. That's the mystery. And we'll talk about God. He existed before. In the beginning that can't be understood. I hope one day. If you and I have an opportunity to be there in heaven with Jesus, we will suddenly understand the nature of who God is all about. So, in the beginning, when we talk about in the book of Revelation, in the book of Genesis, to the book of Revelation, it is God called as Alpha and Omega. And that's what the whole summary is all about. So, let's get into the Monday's part of it, and it's called as the Days of Creation. And if I have to summarize the whole thing about what is the days of creation, you and I are absolutely aware of it, right? First day God created, second day God created, third day God created. In recent years there has been tend to view that creation week is not literal. People come with an argument saying it's not, it's not a literal one. It is not literal. It is as a metaphor. People say that it's a parable. Some even say it is a myth. It is not a literal day cycle, that's what they say. This is arising in the way of the theory of evolution because the days are not literal. So which means evolution theory come into existence and disproves that when God created the seven days week cycle, it is not literal days. That's what in the come to come, which assumes long ages of time. If we have to go a little bit further, what does the Bible teach us on this subject? Why are the days of creation in Genesis 1 to be understood as literal and not figurative days? There are a lot of reasons why. We have a lot of text, okay, we can go through, but uh, uh, I just want to summarize the whole thing in a just uh, in a nutshell. The Hebrew word for our day is called as Yom. Y O Yom. The Hebrew word for a day is Yom. Why O Yen? What does that Yom mean? It simply means that it used consistently <coughs> throughout the creation narratives. How do you find it? For a literal day. Nothing in the Genesis creation narratives indicates that anything other than a literal day was meant. How do we know? As we understand a single day today, what we what we are going through, you know, uh, uh, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, every single day, how it was. In fact, some scholars who don't believe the days were literal will nevertheless admit that the author's intention in the book of Genesis, his intention was to depict literal days. How do we know that? And it is interesting that God himself designates this name for the first unit of time that is recorded in Genesis chapter 1 verse 5. I, I, I just want to read that one. We'll see what, what, what does Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 says. If you have a Bible, sir, wherever you are, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 verse 5. And that is very interesting to note something which is uh, very unique here. 1 verse 5. The Bible says, And God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning was called as the first 
day. Remember the word called Yom in Hebrew. And you can see that literal day, the first day is recorded as Yom. What does that Yom mean? A Yom means day is defined with a phrase and there was evening and there was morning which was recorded in which is recorded in Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 and 8. This term is used in a singular form, not on a plural form. Throughout the creation week, when it is talking about evening and morning, this word called as Yom is used. So which means it is a literal day. Even though the evolutionists or the Darwinians were proving that most probably it might be figurative. And they also agree by the liturgy meaning of Yah, which means literal days. You see, it is not used in a singular form. It is used in a plural form, meaning a single day. So which means an evening and a morning culminated together or from evening to evening becomes the first day. From evening to evening becomes the second day. From evening to evening becomes the third day. It is the 24 hour cycle. The term again is used in a singular, not on a plural form. So which means a single day, literal day. Thus the seven days of creation are to be understood as a complete unit of time introduced by the cardinal number called as a card e c h a d what is this e c h a d means one evening to evening is one which means literal it is not used as a singular it is used it is used as a singular not in a plural form then this ekha E C A D, which means one literal days. This pattern indicates that a consecutive, consecutive sequence of days culminating in the seventh day. This is no indication in the use of a term or in the narrative form itself that there should be any gaps between these days. The seven days of creations are indeed seven days as we deliberate days today as single day and also the literal nature of the day if you have to look into the literal nature of the day is taken for granted when God wrote with his own finger about the fourth commandment keep the Sabbath day holy 24 hour cycle Indicating that the basis of the seventh day Sabbath rests on a sequence of a literal seventh day creation week. It is part, Sabbath has become a part of the creation week. It is not excluded, it is inclusive. Inclusive, it is included. The Genesis creation isn't the only creation in the Bible, there's also the recreation process. When the Lord comes the second time, that's what we find in 1st Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. The Bible is absolutely very clear when God will transform mortality into immortality. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye and the last trumpet. If however God can do this instantly at the recreation, why would he use brilliance of yours for the first creation at theistic evolution teaches? You see? Have to go to the book of uh, First Corinthians. You'll be able to find that with a twinkling of an eye, that you and I will be changed. So, which means uh, the scientific arguments: uh, how man was created billions of years ago, was it necessary? Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the account of Bible can never be wrong. Right? If you and I have the faith in Christ, who created each one of us. Let's get into another topic which is called as the Sabbath and Creation. Uh, today the seventh day, Advent, the seventh day Sabbath is heavily under attack in secular society. You know why? It is attacked in a secular society. It is attacked in the religious communities. 
This fact can be seen in a work schedule of global cooperation. In the attempting change of the calendar in many European countries designated Monday as the first day of the week and Sunday as the seventh day. <clears throat> and by the reason people encyclical on climate change that calls the seventh day Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, and encourage the world to observe a day of rest to elevate global warming. Yeah, that, that will be able to find in, uh, in Pope Francis when he uh, when he wrote this book called Lock and OC by Vatican City, Vatican Press 2015, page 172 to 173. And the date that Monday is the first day of the week. And then comes to Sunday as the seventh day, Sabbath, when the calendar changed. And because of the global warming, they say that we have to keep uh, you know, Sunday as a day of worship, which is absolutely very baseless. The Bible says on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. After resting upon the seventh day, he sanctified it and he set apart a day of rest for man. That's what we find that in, uh, uh, in, 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 in the Genesis account. If you have to look into the Patriots and Prophets, page 47, in the Bible says this is why Jesus can say the Sabbath was made for man and not man for Sabbath. Mark chapter 2 verse 27. What does that mean? It simply means that Jesus could make this authoritative statement because he made or he created the Sabbath as an eternal sign or it is called as the seal of God's covenant with his people and because of that the Sabbath was not for the Hebrew people only but for all humanity. All humanity. And that's one of the reasons you'll find that Genesis indicates three things that Jesus did after he created the Sabbath day. What did he first? First he did was he rested on the Sabbath day. Genesis chapter 2 verse 2. Giving us a divine example of his desiring to rest with us. That's number one. He rested. Number two. He blessed the seventh day. Genesis chapter 2 verse 3 you'll find that Jesus blessed the seventh day. In the whole creation narrative, animals are blessed, right? If you have to look into Genesis chapter 1 verse 22, animals were blessed. And Adam and Eve were blessed, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. But the only specific day was blessed is the seventh day. So number one, God rested. Number two, God blessed. And number three, God sanctified it. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 3, it says God sanctified it. Or, the other word for sanctified is, He made it holy. He made it holy. No other day in the Bible receives this three designation. What is this three designation? God rested, God blessed, and God sanctified. Don't ever forget these three elements when we talk about Sabbath day. No other day in the Bible receives these three designations. These three actions are repeated in the fourth commandment. Though when God writes with his own finger and points back to creation as the foundation for the Sabbath, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Beautiful thing, right? And that's what we can compile with. Revelation chapter 14 was summing the three angels message Fear God and give glory to him who created the heaven and the earth and the springs of the living water God. Place it back to the book of Genesis, right? So the book of Genesis plays a very important role. Let's go a little bit further. On a Wednesday's lesson we have the topic called as creation and marriage. Creation and marriage. If I have to summarize the whole thing, on the sixth day, sixth day God comes to the climax of his creation, the creation of humanity. It is very much fascinating that the plural is used for God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. <coughs> listen to this one. Okay, listen to this one. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. What is the plural form that the Lord has been used here? He said, and God said, 
let us make man. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit enjoying themselves with this fascinating creation God created you and me. And no wonder Psalm is put forth very clearly says, You are fearfully and wonderfully made. It is fascinating that the plural is used for God. Let us make man in our image. All persons of the triune God have a loving relationship with each other. Now create the divinely instituted human relationship of marriage here on this earth. In the image of God, he created male and female. That's what we, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 talks about. Adam declares, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Genesis chapter 2 verse 23. And Adam names her woman. Marriage requires that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. You see, the institution of marriage was instituted on this earth and you and I were created so specifically. Scripture is unequivocal that this relationship is to take place between whom? A man? And a woman who themselves originate from their own father and mother, who was a man and a woman. This concept is further clarified in the instruction given, given to the earth's first parents that God blessed them. Don't ever forget this one. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and what? Multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. You will find that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. In the fifth commandment, children, which means the offspring of the parents have to honor their father and their mother who came to a man and a woman called as father and mother. This interrelationship cannot be fulfilled without anything but a heterosexual partnership. That make sense? Why am I making this statement? A very profound statement from the Bible. Because marriage, in the light of Jesus' words, and while never forgetting God's love for all humanity, and that all of us are sinners, how you and I should be able to get back to the God, to be recreated. You see, God gives us an opportunity. It talks about the interrelationship between a man and a woman. Today we have a lot of homosexuality becoming so legal. A whole lot of things are happening. But God's original plan, when He created man and woman, and that is the true relationship. <coughs> Marriage, holy. Offsprings, holy. And that's the way how God entitled people. The last but not the least, you have to summarize the whole thing. It is called as the creation, the fall, and the cross. The Bible provides an unbroken link between the perfect creation, the fall, and we have the promised Messiah. And of course, we know that the final redemption will suddenly take place. These three major events becomes the basis of the theme of salvation history for the human race. Three very important. The creation, the fall, and the promised Messiah, or the final redemption. These three major events become the basis of this theme of salvation's history for the human race. God declares his creation very good, right? Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. Every day when he created, he always said that it was good. The creation was now complete. Eden bloomed on earth. Adam and Eve had a free access to the tree of life. No taint of sin or shadow of death marred their fair creation. <coughs> no way. It was not marred. It was pure. It was holy. God had warned Adam and Eve if they ate of the forbidden tree, they would what? Surely die. 
But he can't read. Satan came and said, the very moment you eat the fruit, you shall not die, which was contrary to God's word. The serpent began his discourse with a question and a completely contradicted what God has said. You will not surely die. Genesis chapter 3 was spoken. Satan promised Eve great knowledge that she would be like God. Obviously she believed it. <laughs> yes, my dear brothers and scriptures, it's absolutely very clear for you and me. We can see where later biblical writers confirmed either biblical statement and provided additional insights in Romans chapter 5 when 8 you'll be able to see you know, Paul writes about sin and the beauty of salvation sin entered the world through how? one man sin entered this world with one man what happened? and death through sin came into existence and this way death came to all people Romans chapter 5 verse 12 but an evolutionary perspective would have death present for millions of years prior to humanity. This idea has serious implications for the biblical teachings of the origin of sin. But Christ's substitution, uh, uh, substitutionary death on the cross and the plan of salvation. If death is not related to sin, then the wages of sin is not what? Death. So, the whole creation story is at stake. Which is not true. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible says it very clearly the wages of sin is death. What Satan was implying on Eve is uh, you shall not surely die. But you and I will be able, you and I have seen the implication of what sin could do for you and me today. And the plan of salvation was been given for you and me. If death is not related to sin, then the wages of sin is not death. And Christ would have not had more reason to die for our sins. Thus, creation, the fall, and the cross are inextricably linked. The first Adam is tried to the last Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 and 47, the Bible is absolutely very clear. Because of the first Adam, which is recorded in the book of Genesis, sinned, and sin came into existence, and because of that, you and I died. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47, Paul very much says, and the second Adam, that is Jesus Christ, and because of him, of righteousness, you and I will be able to be made righteous. One man's sin, that is Adam, which is recorded in the book of uh, Genesis, and the second Adam, which comes in the New Testament, that is the Messiah, the plan of salvation, Jesus, who died on the cross of Calvary. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the cumulative evidence that we find in the account of Genesis gives us a hope, gives us a sense that Jesus, who has all the power to create this world in seven days, is willing to recreate our lives when it comes to the second time. Do we have the faith and belief in him to carry out his cause on this earth? So when we talk about the book of Genesis, you'll be able to find a very beautiful account that gives us an opportunity to trust in that God. You and I have been created in this image. The little days, the seven days weeks high Everything supports for you and me to trust in that Almighty God who is called as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The greatest minds, if not guided by the world, not becomes bewildered in the attempts to investigate a whole lot of stuff. But you and I believe in creation, believe in a God who created you and me. Believe in the plan of redemption that Jesus came and died on the cross of Calvary, believes, you and I believe that when it comes to the second time, with the twinkling of an eye, you and I will be changed. And that's what the account of Genesis teaches you and me. So may God bless each one of us as we contemplate on this Sabbath school lesson. 
and I hope that we all enjoyed uh, looking into this beautiful concept of what creation is all about. And uh, once again, uh, to complete this one, let us not forget uh, the memory text that we read uh, in John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, that is Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. He is the Alpha and Omega. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made. And was made in Him was life, and the life was the light of man, that is in Jesus Christ. May God bless each one of us as we contemplate on this one. So to conclude this Sabbath school lesson or to begin our divine service, let's all join in and singing this uh, beautiful song from uh, this uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, hymnal 315, all for a closer walk, which is found in the uh, SDA. Once again, I want to repeat, it says, our responsibility 
is to get God's word to their ears. Only God can get their word from their ears to their heart by Albert Moller. All human beings have rights and responsibilities. All human beings have rights and responsibilities. What matters in the end is how responsible we are to one another. And that's how our lives will be judged. We are all called as what? Christians, followers of Christ. We all are called as Christians to get God's word into many years as possible and then God will work on getting his word from their ears to the heart. What a beautiful thought. What a beautiful thought. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us take responsibility. Let us take responsibility in being able to share this good news of the gospel of Christ in each one of our lives so that one day somebody might hear through our lives and they might turn to Jesus Christ. It is time to pray. Let us pray to share our faith and the gospel to every year that can hear. If you have any concerns and prayer requests, please email us or call us. And surely we are here to do our best as possible to serve you. If not anything, we could certainly kneel down and seek the Lord in prayer on each one of our behalves. And of course, we have to pray for uh, the trying times where people have been jobless, people are suffering from sickness, people have difficulties, and uh, people are looking for hope, and it's our responsibility that we have to pray. So at this moment, let us enter into the throne room of God and seek the Lord in prayer. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you, we glorify your name. Because you are our God and you made us your children. O Lord of heaven, there is nothing good in us but you are good, O Lord. Your mercy have endured. Any sins that we are committed against your will, please do forgive us. Accept us as we are. Answer this little prayer. May your name be glorified. At this time, I want to pray, O oh Father, for many people who have been sick, suffering. O Lord, only the may feels hand of Christ may be able to touch them, bring healing physically, spiritually, mentally. May the mercy of God and God in their lives. I want to pray for many people who have lost their lives, O oh Father, because of this COVID-19 and many other illnesses. Please, Lord, be close with those lovely family members. Strengthen them, give them hope and courage. Yes, Lord of heaven, I want to pray for the Hopeside Community Church. Use us mightily as empty vessels used by the righteous right hand of Jesus Christ so that we might be an instrument used by you and you alone and through our lives many more souls might be drawn to your kingdom. Yes, Lord, we have responsibility. We have responsibility towards one another. Yes, Lord, as Christians, help us to take God's word into many years as possible. And certainly through this little gospel, many more souls might have an opportunity to see Jesus. We come to ourselves, O oh Father, as we listen to your word today. And I believe that your presence will go with us. Strengthen us, O oh Father, physically, spiritually, mentally. Empower us, O oh Father, with your loving words. So that it gives us stability. It gives us strength spiritually. And certainly speak to us, O oh Father, so that we could listen to your word, walk in it, experience your joy, peace, and happiness in our lives. And certainly have this hope of the second coming of Jesus where we can go home with you. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Be with me, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Use me mightily. May your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. It is time for offering and 
and uh, wherever you might be. We have to set a portion for the Lord. What belongs to the Lord belongs to the Lord. There is nothing that we can offer to Him. We can only return what He has been given to us. Uh, we don't want to upgrade each one. Uh, you can send your offerings by mail or go online to our website and give offerings by PayPal too. Our website is hopeside.org where you will find our address at the mail to offering online. You are needed now more than ever. The Lord's word has to be spread and we commit ourselves in spreading this word. We want to encourage us, give us generously so that we can carry out this gospel uh, to many as possible and serve to the best of our ability. For scripture and meditation, uh, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 it says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Verse 9. Not of works, lest any man can boast about. And today, my sermon is entitled as You Can't Outsmart God. Have you ever thought of outsmarting God? Or can God be outsmarted? That's the question. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, many of us think that we can fool God. But usually you and I been able to fool ourselves. God can never be mocked, that's what the word of God says. And today we'll see that many people are trying to outsmart God in one way or the other by questioning him. Many times we try to put him into problem. It is not that he will be put into problem. You and I will get into problem. We have many incidences in the Bible. Many wanted to outsmart Jesus 2,000 years ago while he was there on this earth. Never knew that they fell into trap. We have many examples that way. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus not to find the solutions for the problem. Not to find answers for the questions. Not to find healing in the mighty power. But they came to trap Jesus in every angle so that they could win and he could lose. God is always God. God is always the beginning, the Alpha and Omega. That's what we uh, just studied uh, uh, in a Sabbath school lesson. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is the one who is the creator, redeemer and sustainer. Even though Jesus was born 2,000 years ago in a humble background, as a simple human being, but he was uh, born with a spirit. He was part of the triune God. He came to humanity to rescue you and me. He came to show the parts of righteousness. Let's turn the Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, a profound uh, uh, verse that we have today. If you have to look into the book of Luke chapter 10, you will find a very important aspect uh, and a story being narrated. If you have to go to Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37, you have the whole story. You and I know the story very much. You and I have read the story many times. You and I, I will able to experience what this story is all about. You and I have listened to the story for many, many long years. You and I know what this story is really talking about. Again, we'll look at another passage contained in only in Luke. Remember this incident once again. 
which took place on the other side. It is during the time before okay, the Holy Spirit was descended upon this earth on Pentecost, the right of Pentecost. Before that, so it was the during the time of dispensation of the law, not of grace. Jesus was still there in the ministry on this earth. He was not put to cross. So still they were there in the period of the law, not of grace. The law said a whole lot of things that you and I have to keep it. So the Mosaic law was in operation. The Mosaic law was to be kept. And here you will be able to find an important person, a lawyer. A lawyer coming to Jesus. <laughs> you will find that in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and 29. I want to read this one. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Underline this word called what? Tempted him. Verse 25. He says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, What? Master, you see, a lawyer so humbly approaching Jesus as a master. So he knew he was a teacher. He knew he had an exceptional quality of answering. He knew that he was a very brilliant man. So humbly he asked him, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 26, he says, he said unto him, what is written in the law? How real is thou? Jesus reciprocates. What is that written in the law? Now, who is this lawyer? Who were the lawyers? And we see them time and again scheming against Jesus throughout the whole New Testament in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These lawyers were supposed to be what? The keepers of the law, magnifying the law. They're coming to Jesus Christ who gave the law to Moses, who gave the law for you and me, the Decalogue, the moral law. Of or the Ten Commandments, asking him. We see them time and again scheming against Jesus. A lawyer, or in the Bible, he is called as a scribe, was an expert on the law of Moses. He knew completely. He had to know. And that's one of the reason he is called as a lawyer. He was not asking for information, but was hoping to grant Jesus in a mistake, and that's the reason I told you, please underline the word for what? Tempted. Verse 25, right? Once again, I won't read that. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. He didn't want an information because he felt that he knew everything. He came to tempt. Jesus was tempted. I and he were tempted. You see? The so called as the wise, the so called as the known. He was not asking for information at all, but was hoping to trap Jesus in a mistake. What was his first question? His first question was this. He asked, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? For him, it was all about what one did, which means salvation by works. If you have to go to any other religion, we have to do something good in order to attain salvation. That was the concept, even during the time of Jesus Christ. So, how does Jesus encounters with a question for this expert who knew about the law, who knew about the Mosaic law, and the Zipro case that, and he says, "What is written in the law?" How readest thou? Many times is a question to be posed for you and me. How do we read the word of God? How do we understand the word of God? How do we interpret the word of God? Until unless the spirit is bestowed upon you and me, you and I can never ever understand. And no wonder 
even though the lawyer was an expert, he was una unable to understand certain concepts. He came to put Jesus into a trap. Many times it happens that when many of us read the word of God in order for knowledge to gain knowledge, we read the word of God to make sure that we could explain to others and stand out and say that I know Bible much more than anything else. So which means you and I are trying to tempt God. Trying to put God into problem. And Jesus encounters with the question for an expert, what is that written in the law? How do you stop? The lawyer was probably congratulating himself and he answered and he said very clearly, Thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and love your neighbor as thyself. So the lawyer knew exactly what the law was talking about. He summed up all the law. And Jesus gave him an A grade for that. Yes, lawyer, you know it completely. You know it completely. He summed up the whole law and Jesus gave him an A for his answer. And his second question, in verse 29. In second, in second, the second question, in verse 29, what's the Bible saying? But he was willing to justify himself and said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? The first time, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as a son. And know that I have read this, and that's the reason I'm a lawyer. I'm perfect. I know what you're talking about. You don't need to tell me. You see, the lawyer is reciprocating with Jesus with this argument. I know that. Second, he asked in verse 29, who is my neighbor? He had hoped to trap Jesus, but falls into the trap himself as he takes a second question. And who is my neighbor? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I, are the lawyers or anybody on this earth, even the greatest minds that you can think about on this earth, can never outsmart Jesus. He gives a parable with the loaded with landmines for the lawyer. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and he gives a loaded with landmines for the lawyer. And he says, uh, you can't play games with Jesus. That's what you find in, uh, uh, in uh, verse 30 to 35. You'll be able to find an important aspect of it. A very important aspect. And you know the story of the Samaritan. I don't want to explain to that. You know, I used to play chess with one of my good friends when I was a spice of He was an expert. Every time I played with him, I lost. Every time I played with him, I lost. And today, I know that chess is not my game. And I will never play chess with anyone, even with my own children, because I know that I'm going to lose it. The lawyer considered himself righteous, but his attitude was really do what I say, not what I do. And that's the concept of everyone, right? Many people feel that, do what I say, not what do I do. This attitude was absolutely wrong. The scribes believed that only the righteous were their neighbors. The sinners like tax collectors, prostitutes, and they are the haters, and they are the enemies of God. That's what they believed. Only the righteous are my neighbor, not the bad ones. Only the good ones are my neighbor, not the evil ones. You know, that's what the belief system they had. And that's what the reason the royal is coming and counting Jesus. Who is my neighbor? The scribes believed in a very intimate way that only righteous were the neighbors. Listen to this one. Jesus knew the hearts of the scribes. He knew the hearts of the scribes. He once said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, Woe unto you, Pharisees! Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bone and of all uncleanness. The approach was Jesus having with the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. He simply said, you are hypocrites. You are whitewashed sepulchers. Outside you look good. Inside you are rotten. Because they always believed, listen to what I say. Don't do what I do. That's what he says in the book of Matthew chapter 23. The Bible says it very clearly. Okay, Jesus also said, please listen to them what they say. But don't do as they do. That's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees believed it. And Jesus told the parable of the Samaritan. The Samaritan was a hero. That's what we find in verse 30 and 35. There are four characters. There are terrible thieves here. Interested only in what they could get. Thieves are there to get what they want. That's all. And then the passing priest, he was too busy to care about others. The looking Levite, curious but lacking concern, they all disregarded the law. But we have the fourth personality, that is the Samaritan, had compassion and acted on it. Four people don't ever forget. Number one, the terrible thieves will come and snatch away. Number two, the passing priest, he was too busy to care for others. Number three, the looking Levite, curious but lacking concern. Number four, the Samaritan, who was what? Showed compassion and acted on it. So Jesus revealed the lawyer in and he said, ask a question with only one possible answer. You find that it was 36. When the lawyer asked him, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, there was only one possible way that this lawyer could answer Jesus. That's what we find in verse 36. It says, which now of these thinkest thou? was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. There was no option for the lawyer who came so vigorously to put Jesus into a trap, fell into his own trap. There was only one answer which was recorded in 37th verse. And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. You see, you can't outsmart Jesus at any cost. Only one answer left to the lawyer to say that the person who showed mercy is my neighbor. You know that. But the scribes and the Pharisees believe, please listen to what I say, but don't do what I do. But Jesus is telling, no, please do what you say. Practice what we preach. If you and I are Christian, if you and I are not concerned about our neighbor, if you and I have the same prejudice just the way how the lawyer had, only righteous are our neighbor, only a person who does good for me is my neighbor, only a person who loves me is my neighbor, it's a wrong concept. Christianity doesn't have any meaning in it because Jesus came to this world to seek and save the lost. And one way or the other, you and I are lost. Nobody is greater than anyone. We all are equal in front of God. You and I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You and I are not the way how we are. That's what Jesus is talking about. And that's the reason Christianity is of no use for the hedonistic world when they look into our lives. Because we only speak, we don't follow. But Jesus is telling, 
the lawyer. The question that you asked, who is my neighbor? And he is telling, practice what we preach. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, the Bible says it very clearly. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and onions and cumin, and have matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Being faithful to Christ means that practice what we preach. What does this mean for us? Many have misconception about this parable. It is not the gospel according to the state farm, like a good neighbor, no. It is not that good sand club doing good works, no. It is not the Santa Claus coming once in a year and being able to give out gifts, no. Being a good neighbor will not get you into heaven, no. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. Listen to this beautiful statement. For by grace ye are saved through faith. You and I have sinned and come short glory of God. It took grace. It took Jesus. He left the whole heaven, came down to this earth, even though you and I don't deserve life, even though you and I don't deserve to call God the Father, you and I don't deserve to be His servant, but still, by His grace, you and I have been made as His children. We don't deserve, by His grace, He has given us an opportunity. When God has given His grace for you and me, what is that voting? behind us should not we not impart the same grace what we have received freely to anyone who comes in contact with us it is a responsibility it is a responsibility to take this gospel of Jesus Christ to the nook and corner it is a responsibility to mind our neighbors it is a responsibility to be a good neighbor and do the best as possible. As in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, uh, It is the gift of God. When God has bestowed a gift upon you and me, what are we doing with that gift? Are we hiding? Are we not being able to give to the person who is in need? Are we not being able to take the gospel for the people who are in need? Many people are dying not with food. Yes, of course they are good. I mean, dying with food. I'm not saying no. Much more than that, you 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 you, you, you represent yourself about who Jesus is all about and lead people to the bread of life that is Jesus Christ. You and I have to lead people to the bread of life that is Jesus Christ. You and I have to lead people to Jesus to be healed. You and I are to lead souls to the kingdom of Jesus Christ so that he will take care of their business. My responsibility and your responsibility is to lead our neighbors to Christ. How do we lead our neighbors to Christ? By being a good Christian, being a good example, not like the lawyer who said, I only preach, I don't follow. It is all how about by the same grace through faith you and I can't save ourselves only Jesus has to come into the picture to be saved it is the gift of God not of works that anyone can be able to boast about no way that's what it means it's all about the heart look into the the beautiful story of the good Samaritan it is all the heart as I said, we have the thieves, we have a lot of thieves. They come to snatch away. We have the passing priest. He was too busy to care about. We have the looking Levite. He was curious. 
but he lacked concern. And we have the Samaritan who showed by example what we are supposed to. Isn't that a beautiful story? Was the lawyer been able to outsmart Jesus? He came to grab Jesus. And what happened? God revealed the heart of the lawyer. If you and I submit ourselves to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He will reveal our heart to you and me. It's all about the heart. The Bible says it very clearly. In the last days, I will put my laws and my statutes in the innermost part of your body. The innermost part of your body. He will put his laws and his statutes in our heart. Heart matters. If you have been born again, you have a new heart. That's what I was talking about. And the person came and asked Jesus, what should I do to have eternal life? You should be born again. Nicodemus, born again. Even this 21st century, we are living in this last days of time. You and I have to be born again. In order to have a new heart. You love others because God first loved you. You forgive others because you have been forgiven. You have compassion because God had compassion on you. Matthew chapter 10 verse 8, the Bible says, Freely you have received, freely you gave. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I would like to sum up this thought that I want to present to you. You and I can never outsmart Jesus at any cost. But God, in His own infinite mercy, even though He was the smartest man ever lived on this earth, and you see the characteristics of Jesus Christ, He always had a helping hand. They always walked through to make sure that many people who didn't have anything, they had some. God gave an opportunity for you and me through Jesus Christ. He left the whole celestial being to come and die for you and me. Compassionate Savior who came, who lived, who died, and who resurrected. Who resurrected. And He is giving us the hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. What an opportunity, my dear brothers and sisters, Christ, to emulate his character in our life on this earth in the of the century, to know who is a neighbor, love our neighbor to the best of ability, and take this beautiful gospel to the nook and corner of wherever we are, however it is possible. You speak to the Lord, you ask him in prayer, he will show you where you're supposed to, what you're supposed to. And my life and your life should be a life where used by the righteous right hand of Jesus Christ. Are you ready to be used by God in this last days? In conclusion, I like the words of this great man called Spurgeon. He says, Let it never be forgotten that what the Lord demands of us, the gospel really produces in us. Let it never be forgotten that what the Lord demands of us, the gospel really produces in us. We have to be producers of the law. The producers, the fruit bearers, until unless you and I bear fruits for Jesus in his last days on this earth, you and I will be put to shame one day. May God bless us as we contemplate on this word. May the Lord empower us with the Spirit so that we will have an opportunity where we could work for Him. We could be a part of Him. Show mercy and compassion to our neighbors. Not the way how the lawyer did it, but the way how the Samaritan did it. So that one day God will find that you and me and His mercy might endure in our lives. And we could be a part of it forever and ever when it comes to sin back. That's my prayer for you this uh, evening. May God bless each one of us as we contemplate on this word. In closing,
Let's all join in and sing this uh, beautiful song, which is in SDA Hymnal 367. 367. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is coming again.